there's a, a relationship uh, between uh, these uh, uh, the topics that are uh, being discussed in this session uh, in that uh, my interest in uh, wealth and uh, you know Tony Schrocks and so on um, uh, is not so much uh, fascination with uh, the top end of the distribution as a concern about uh, welfare and um, in a kind of an expanded view of vulnerability to poverty, uh, personal assets play a very important role in uh, cushioning uh, the blows that uh, plunge people into poverty. Um, uh, having personal assets is a form of uh, self-insurance. And, uh, you know, uh, in uh, Ethiopia, for example, uh, herders will build up their uh, herds of cattle uh, when times are good, and then these are run down when times are bad. In Indonesia, people um, acquire, uh, quite uh, frequently it's quite common to acquire gold as a personal asset when times are good, and then use this when times are bad. Um, wealth, has, uh, wealth and personal assets have many, uh, there are many different dimensions of how they improve, can improve the lives of uh, lower and, and uh, middle class people. Um, they, they provide empowerment and independence. Um, if you're in a village in India and uh, the uh, local uh, major landholder or uh, uh, you know, somebody else is uh, oppressing you in some way, if you have some uh, financial assets and you can go and hire yourself a lawyer to uh, fight back, or a group of people can get together and hire a lawyer to fight back, uh, or you know take other steps uh, to defend themselves. Then obviously they are, you know, significantly empowered relative to if they didn't have those assets. So um, you know, we see wealth as uh, as very important in uh, in those aspects. Um, so as uh, Tony said yesterday, uh, the work that we've been doing estimating the global distribution of wealth started at WIDER. And uh, recently uh, we've been doing uh, estimates on an annual basis. They're uh, published by the Credit Suisse Research Institute. Uh, and uh, the report comes out uh, every year in October. So towards the end of October, uh, you should see uh, press coverage of our uh, 2014 report uh, coming out. And uh, for this audience, it's important to emphasize that we actually put out two publications every year, about a month after the report comes out, which is kind of a glossy publication that's aimed at a very broad audience, but is nevertheless um, 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 you know, I, I, we think professional, incredible, and so on. Uh, about a month after that, a um, publication comes out called The Data Book, which indeed has an awful lot of numbers in it, but it also has a more rigorous presentation of the topics which are uh, covered in the report. So for uh, uh, social science or academic audience, the data book is, uh, is very important, so look for that as well. Um, okay, so uh, wealth here means uh, real assets plus financial assets minus debts. Um, and uh, as I say, we're looking at the global distribution uh, of wealth. We use um, official exchange rates. Uh, that does lead to issues of uh, fluctuations in uh, relative wealth in different countries and different regions and so on because of changes in official exchange rates. So we supplement our estimates with um, other numbers where we take the average exchange rate over the period of time that we're studying and so we can say what, you know, how things would be different if there had not been exchange rate fluctuations from one year to the next. In each report, um, we've looked at special topics. So here's the list. So uh, first uh, year we did uh, gender dimensions and looked at wealth composition. The next year we looked at long run trends in the level of wealth. So we're looking at bubbles and busts and uh, booms and so on. And uh, things like the wealth income ratio and how that's varied over time. Um, the following year, uh, we uh, did work on debt and inheritance. And last year we did uh, mobility including uh, mobility among the uh, Forbes billionaires. And uh, we took a critical look at uh, wealth in the Eurozone because a very important development 
in uh, 2012 uh, was the release of the um, well survey data that had been prepared uh, on a uh, well, it was attempted that it would, would be prepared on a consistent basis for all the uh, Eurozone countries. Um, the quality of the surveys uh, varied a little bit in some of the smaller countries uh, was uh, not very strong, but uh, that really is a major step forward in the development of uh, wealth distribution data um, because of the comparability of uh, definitions and uh, methods uh, across those uh, 15 or so countries. And this year, uh, we're looking at the inequality trends since the year 2000, so uh, look for that in the report that's coming out in October. Um, so uh, some details uh, about the methods. Um, we look at the adult population. Um, our, there are two aspects to our work. One is establishing wealth levels, and the other is establishing the distribution of wealth uh, within each country. I should probably put on my glasses here. Um, so, there, uh, household balance sheets are actually part of the UN system of national accounts. And uh, these balance sheets are implemented for financial assets and for liabilities in 47 countries. This includes the richest countries, uh, well, m most of the OECD countries. Uh, developing countries are relatively few that have household balance sheets. Um, Colombia has it, South Africa has it, it's a, it's a relatively uh, short list. But among the developed countries, this is a standard uh, form of data, and a lot of work has gone into preparing it over the years. And so what that means is that you can scale uh, your estimate of the uh, distribution of house, household wealth uh, in uh, these countries. There are 17 countries that have also, in their household balance sheet, they have non-financial assets. So the US, the UK, you know, Canada, Germany, etc. Um, so uh, what we do, and uh, the technique was outlined in our uh, article in the Economic Journal in, in uh, 2011, is uh, we use regression methods to uh, look at the determ determinants of uh, wealth in the uh, countries that have the balance sheet data, and then we extend this, uh, do imputations for the uh, countries that uh, don't have the HBS data. Uh, we can do that in 120 countries. Of course, you need the right-hand side variables to uh, perform the estimates. There are 216 countries in total, um, 39 of them as Tony was saying yesterday, uh, we use region income class averages to uh, get these levels. These are uh, mostly very small countries. I think they add up to something like 4% of the uh, global population. Uh, now, distribution of wealth, since we started our work, the number of uh, countries that have uh, good uh, wealth distribution surveys uh, has expanded from 20 to uh, 31. Uh, partly as a result of what uh, was done in the Eurozone. Um, but um, in the developing world, uh, Chile, um, Thailand, um, you know, a few countries have uh, come online with this uh, kind of data. Um, China and India and Indonesia all have, uh, well, China and India have wealth surveys which are being conducted on an ongoing basis. Indonesia had a wealth survey in 1997, so it's getting a little bit uh, out of date now. But uh, when we started this work 10 years ago uh, and discovered that there were, were these surveys in China and India, um, we realized that we were in business and you could actually do something to estimate the world distribution of wealth. Without that, it really wouldn't be possible, but there you're bringing in a third of the world's population. Uh, and uh, gaining valuable evidence that can be used to uh, extend estimates to uh, other uh, developing countries as well. Um, okay, so just a little bit uh, more information about estimating wealth uh, levels. Um, the uh, balance sheet data, um, the uh, statistical organizations, central banks, and so on that prepare this 
uh, can use um, essentially whatever data that they have. So it's not just from wealth surveys, it's from other sources, it's from institutional sources, financial assets and debts and so on. This information is uh, very uh, reliable and credible. Um, uh, on the uh, real asset side, you can estimate uh, the value of housing, for example, by using a perpetual inventory. This would be true for uh, farm uh, machinery and equipment and vehicles and so on. Uh, there are four countries uh, where there's a survey, but there's no household balance sheets. That's China, India, um, Chile, and uh, I guess uh, one other, maybe Indonesia. Um, okay, so, um, you know, you might ask, well, um, is there, you know, much difference between uh, wealth and income levels across uh, countries? Uh, in this graph, uh, we've got our estimate of wealth per capita versus GDP per capita in 2013. You can see that uh, there is this uh, fairly strong relationship. R squared is uh, 83%. Um, but... Um, there's some variation. So you have, um, say, if you look along the, look here, we have uh, a number of countries in this range between, say, $40,000 and $50,000 of uh, GDP per capita. And uh, there is a you know, significant amount of variation in terms of their wealth per capita. Um, and this uh, country up here, I believe, is... Switzerland, which is, you know, quite far off and uh, deviates there. I believe this is Australia, which is kind of smack on the line. Um, okay, so I'll say a few words about how we estimate um, uh, our regression, and uh, which we use to do uh, imputations. We have uh, three different regressions, actually. We've got financial assets and liabilities. The two of them um, uh, come together, so we have exactly the same number of observations uh, for the you know, particular countries. Uh, so we use the seemingly unrelated reg regression technique to estimate those two, and then uh, real assets are uh, done separately. Um, and uh, the kind of thing that you're looking for here, actually, uh, you might ask why uh, we use log consumption per capita as a regressor. Uh, really, we'd like to use income, but um, income data are available for significantly fewer countries where we want to do the imputations. And it turns out that if you run this regression using consumption rather than income for the countries where there is data, you get very similar results. And then you can um, do imputations for more countries, so that's why we use consumption. Um, this is in log form, so if financial assets were going to go up 10% um, when income went up 10%, this uh, coefficient would be equal to 1. But see, it's actually higher than 1, right? And uh, if we, I don't have the chart here for the real assets, but you see that it's closer to 1 uh, in the case of real assets. And the, the fundamental uh, approach here is to... Uh, put in the variables that would, uh, the life cycle model would predict, uh, would explain differences across countries. So this is growth rates. Um, longevity is uh, predicted to have a positive effect on uh, wealth in the life cycle model. Uh, in some of the regressions, it turns out that these life LCM variables don't, are not significant. We drop those. That's why you don't see them all here. And then we have some other variables like the market capitalization rate, which reflect financial conditions. Um, and so those are brought in in addition. And you see here that the uh, percentage of the urban population is uh, a significant variable. Uh, survey dummy, is this quite interesting? See, this is a very large coefficient. This says, if you get your financial assets estimate from survey, from a survey source, uh, it's going to be 167% lower on average than if you get it from the household balance sheet, holding everything else constant. So uh, these countries, China, India, where we have to rely on the survey data, um, that would not give us a good estimate of wealth levels in those countries if we do not perform an adjustment. And so what we do is we use this coefficient to perform that adjustment 
um, uh, to get a better idea of uh, what the level of financial assets is in those countries. Here's what's been happening to the uh, aggregate level of global wealth over the years that we've uh, been considering. And you can see there's this uh, big dip in 2008 and uh, some recovery uh, since then. Uh, and the extent of recovery has varied between different regions. Here we have global trends in wealth per adult. The um, top two lines are for uh, net worth. The, um, let's see, the lighter of the two, this one here, is at the at constant exchange rates. The top one is uh, in terms of U.S. dollars. So broadly speaking, you know, these things are fairly similar, but uh, the growth in terms of USD uh, from 2000 to 2013 is greater than in terms of uh, constant exchange rates. So that reflects um, an appreciation on average of other currencies relative to the U.S. dollar. Uh, over that period, and these uh, lower curves are for uh, financial wealth and non-financial wealth. Um, and so you can see, for example, from 2000 to 2007, is that, I guess that's 2008, there was this uh, convergence, and so at this time they were of about equal importance, financial and non-financial assets. Um, as a result of the you know stock market crashes that occurred uh, during the uh, financial crisis, but then the two have separated again. So the financial assets are a bit ahead of the uh, non-financial. Uh, here's a map of world wealth levels. Um, this you know corresponds to the kind of thing that we're uh, used to seeing. So not uh, too many surprises there. You can see that there are a few uh, countries that are just white, and this means that uh, we don't have estimates uh, for those countries due to uh, lack of data. Okay, so uh, wealth levels across countries. Uh, on average, global wealth per adult has gone up from about 31,000 in the year 2000 to uh, about 52,000 uh, today. Uh, you can see there's not much increase in wealth per adult uh, since the peak year just before the uh, financial crisis. Um, country experience has varied. Um, countries like, uh, well, actually, most of the countries that uh, are just been selected here for illustrative purposes have rebounded fairly well from 2007 to 2013. Uh, one case where it's gone in the opposite direction is uh, India, and this is uh, largely due to the uh, depreciation of the rupee. Okay, now... Um, we have 31 countries where there are wealth surveys. Uh, what I'm going to show here and on the next slide is the top part of those distributions. So these are shares of uh, groups that are in the top 25%. So there's another slide that I'm not showing. It would be the entire rest of the distribution. And you might look at this and say, oh, well, this is you know, kind of sparse and so on. Um, well, you don't need uh, any, an enormous amount of... Uh, detail in order to get a plausible estimate of the Lorenz curve. Um, as uh, Tony was explaining yesterday, we use this uh, ungrouping uh, algorithm that fits the data points exactly, and uh, uh, been quite a bit of uh, testing of that, and it uh, gives uh, fairly reliable results. Now, um, as we know, uh, surveys are challenged in the upper tail of the distribution due to uh, problems of sampling and non-sampling error, and the non-sampling error takes the form of uh, non-response, differential non-response, according to the level of wealth, and also uh, under-reporting. So if you don't do anything to address those problems, you get um, an implausibly low share of the top 1%. So here we see in uh, Canada... Actually, Canada does do something about it. Uh, what, what you can do about the upper tail problem is you have a special um, high income or high wealth uh, sample and, and you oversample those people. So you get some kind of independent information. In the United States, they do a really good job based on the use of income tax records to maintain a list of the, uh, the, the, the people that they want to oversample. 
And um, the, the approach works very well, right? And so other countries, for example, Spain, which introduced a wealth survey about 10 years ago, uh, brought in the experts from the Federal Reserve Board to advise them about how to do this. And uh, these kind of methods are spreading a bit, but they should be adopted in more places if there's a serious interest in using the survey to get an estimate of the uh, distribution of wealth. So you see other countries with these relatively low, number, low numbers, 15.7, 14.8. These are not really very credible. And uh, Japan, I'm uh, wondering even if that may actually be a typo here, 4.3%. It's kind of silly. Uh, here are the remainder of the countries at the bottom. Here we have the United States. You see they have an estimate of 34.1%. Another interesting aspect of their procedure is that they explicitly exclude the Forbes 400, and they've always done this. They say, well, the Forbes magazine tells us who these people are and estimates their wealth better than we can probably, so they're just not in our population that we're sampling. And uh, those people have about 2% of the household wealth in the United States. So uh, you would take this number, 34%, and you say, okay, well, I, if I add on the Forbes 400, this, this is a tiny number of people, so it wouldn't change the definition of the top 1% appreciably. You just add on 2%, and then you've got a better estimate of what the share of the uh, top 1% is. Um, and that's transparent, and uh, the Federal Reserve Board is uh, quite upfront about that. Okay, so... Um, so I could uh, go through some of this detail about exactly how we estimate the shape of the wealth distribution. Uh, Tony talked about uh, this yesterday, so I think I'll skip ahead and, and try and get on to the uh, results more. Uh, we impute uh, a, a top tail to the individual countries uh, using the Pareto distribution. It's a very common approach, um, and uh, the particular way that we do it is by... Uh, taking the Forbes uh, evidence about the billionaires and saying, well, that gives us a point on the um, uh, Pareto curve. And uh, then basically we look at... The, the, so the, the philosophy is that these surveys are, are probably pretty good for about the bottom 95% of the population, and then you want to adjust the upper tail. So the... Um, whoops. Where was I? Um, so here's your um, Pareto curve. And uh, so we know from uh, a lot of past evidence from more reliable data sources like estate tax records that it does tend to become linear at some point. And so the idea is to take the uh, Pareto curve or establish a Pareto curve which would do that and would um, line up with the, the number of uh, billionaires. So again, as I say, Tony explained this uh, method yesterday. Okay, here's a comparison of survey data and we got what we get from our estimates. So you see, for example, in Canada, I was saying, well, 15.5 is a bit low. So I've actually done quite a bit of, fair amount of research over the years going back to the 1970s about the Canadian wealth distribution. So I know that number is just too low. And what we have here is 24.7. That is quite a bit lower than the U.S. level. Uh, that makes perfect sense. Um, Canada still has a very, quite a high rate of foreign ownership. And so you could have think of, effectively it's as if God reached down his hand and took a bunch of our high net worth and ultra high net worth people and just moved them across the border. Uh, so they're... Uh, that's yeah, so one way of thinking about it. At any rate, so that's a plausible number. Now, um, the, the adjustments are very large for some countries. India, we're going from 15.7 to 48.7. I mean, there just are um, a f considerable number of very rich people in India. This is also true in Indonesia. But things are different. For example, in you know, a country like Italy, there's not a very large adjustment. If I had more time, I can go into the you know shares of the top 10% and so on. But just let's just look at the shares of the uh, top 1% here. Um, uh, the Nordic uh, countries are interesting. We've got Sweden, uh, Norway. Uh, you can see that the adjustment that's required for the Nordic countries is relatively small. Um, Norway, top 10% goes from 65.3 to 65.9%. Why is that? Well, you don't have the non-response problem. This uh, data is coming uh, uh, from wealth tax records, which go, go through adjustments to make them 
you know, transform the valuation basis and so on, but everybody's included, right? So it makes sense that the Nordic data is uh, more reliable in the upper tail. There are problems in the lower tail that I don't have time to go into at the moment. Okay, so anyways, uh, you put this all together, what you discover is wealth inequality is very high. The world share of the top 10% in our data was uh, 86%, the top 1% at 46% in 2013, and the shares in some individual countries we've already seen them, uh, up there, the top 10% at 61% in China. That's been rising over time. 75% in the U.S., more in some other countries. Uh, overall, the richest 2% of adults own more than half of global wealth, which is a result that uh, we've had since basically from the beginning of our work and uh, received quite a bit of uh, publicity. Global Wealth Genie is uh, in here 0 0.905. Tony was saying yesterday, we really shouldn't report these numbers to the third decimal place, so I guess I should have rubbed that out. So we're getting a number around 0.9. For comparison, um, Branko Blanovich and his uh, co-author Lackner, in their very interesting recent paper, um, have got uh, their most recent numbers, which are for 2008, are from 0.7 to 0.75. This is for income, right? So the wealth genie, I mean, the income genie globally is pretty high, but the wealth genie is, you know, really high. Um, why is there that range there? It's because they do um, top tail adjustment. Their 0.70 is using their standard methods and they look at the top tail adjustments and uh, say that you could get this up as high as 0.75. That's kind of an upper bound for them. Uh, wealth is more unequally distributed than income across countries. So this is an interesting insight. Uh, compared with income distribution, differences between countries are relatively more important for wealth. Uh, here is a chart that just gives you the numbers on the estimate of the global wealth distribution. You see we've got these very low shares at the bottom, including a negative share for the uh, bottom decile. Uh, the global wealth pyramid, which um, Tony uh, again uh, uh, showed yesterday. Um, and uh, let me say, uh, few, again, this is a chart that Tony showed yesterday, but I'll say a few more words about this. Uh, when the um, Marcelo uh, Neres was uh, speaking yesterday, he pointed out Brazil is kind of a microcosm of the world income distribution. Well, here we have Latin America showing up as a bit of a microcosm of the world wealth distribution. Uh, what this chart shows is it arranges the world wealth deciles from 1 to 10, and then it tells you where the people in each decile are living. So about 24% of the people in the bottom decile are in the Asia-Pacific region, which excludes China and India. And then you have a large number from India. Almost nobody, almost nobody in the bottom decile is from China, a large number from Africa, and so on. What I was saying about Latin America, you see the, the uh, height of their bit here relatively speaking, is fairly constant, although it tapers at the top, right? If it was perfectly constant, that would say that they had the same share of every decile in the world wealth distribution. So it really would be exactly a microcosm of the world distribution. The other region, which is approximately like that, is Asia Pacific, omitting China and India. And then the shapes where the others are radically different. India has this long, long upper tail. China has this great big blob here, which um, has been moving to the right and you know you can if that continues then we'll have dominance of china in the upper deciles of the uh, wealth distribution before very long north america interestingly has uh, look it has some people right at the bottom okay and europe again has got actually europe's got even more uh representation in these uh, lower deciles well, what's going on there well you know, wealth is a funny thing, right? I mean, having a lot of wealth is always a good thing. But uh, having zero wealth in a country where you have a highly developed welfare state, um, you live in a rented apartment, you don't own your own house, uh, the state has got a nice pension, or your employer, uh, well, actually, it would be a state pension is a relevant thing here. Um, you don't really need a lot of personal assets to uh, necessarily to have a satisfactory life. And you have young people that have big uh, student debts and have mortgage debt and so on. So, um, you know, you have to, have to be a little bit careful, right? And so actually, uh, the Scandinavian countries 
Finland as well, um, have quite low income inequality and they have quite high wealth inequality. And people have, uh, there are good papers that have been done on this and uh, essentially this is what people think is going on, that uh, you don't necessarily need to have a lot of wealth to uh, do well in those uh, countries. Um, this uh, chart shows uh, where the dollar millionaires are. So in, uh, got 39% of the millionaires in the world in uh, the U.S. Japan, you know, their economy has been stagnant for quite a while, but they still are the second most important country in terms of um, world millionaires. And then you have France, UK, Germany, Italy, and then, you know, a bunch of other countries. So although, you know, there's uh, quite a bit of attention to increasing inequality in China, um, despite the fact that it's the world's most populous country, it only has 3% of the millionaires. So, uh, you know, if we're thinking globally about wealth inequality and you know, where the rich people are, you shouldn't point your finger first at uh, China. It would be the U.S. and Europe and Japan are the principal areas where the wealthy are located. Uh, now, there's some interesting contrasts in terms of uh, the structure of wealth and the relationship of wealth to income. Uh, for the 2011 data, I uh, separated the countries by GDP and the uh, aggregate wealth to GDP ratio for the bottom 80% of the countries, which includes all the low and middle income countries in the world, uh, is uh, basically it's about two. For the 20% uh, top income countries, it's four. Okay, so I was saying earlier that uh, wealth differences are greater than income differences. Well, you can see this is very dramatic, right? Wealth to income ratio of two at the bottom and four at the top. Uh, the ratio of financial to non-financial assets is interesting. It's uh, about two-thirds for that bottom group, and it's about one and a third, so four-thirds. In other words, twice as, as much, which is what you would expect from these numbers, actually. Uh, here, um, there was a very important uh, scholar who worked on uh, wealth at Yale University. Many people recognize his name, uh, uh, Raymond Goldsmith, and he published a number of uh, important books. And uh, he thought this, uh, he called this the, what do you call it? The next slide says, um, the financial interrelations ratio. Um, and uh, he thought that typically this financial interrelations ratio, as he called it, was about a half for uh, developing countries. And he expected that um, for developed countries, it would converge on a value of about one. So we've got numbers which are higher, but the ratio between the two things is, is, is a two-to-one ratio, which is uh, what he was uh, expecting. Um, he talked about this in a, a book in 1985. And by the way, in this book, he also estimated what he called the planetary balance sheet. So there's, uh, he had 17 data from 17 or 18 countries, much of which he had built up himself uh, through, you know, by dint of really hard labor. You couldn't just uh, go on the internet and collect the data in those days. You actually had to physically go around to the different countries and get to know the statisticians and uh, get their data and so on. Um, at any rate, um, I think if uh, Raymond Goldsmith could estimate the planetary balance sheet from 17 or 18 countries back then, we shouldn't feel too shy about estimating it today on the basis of uh, balance sheet data from 47 countries and um, the imputation methods that uh, are used. Um, asset composition is certainly of uh, uh, great interest, and it varies enormously between countries. What we've got here is the uh, sort of greenish bars over here are debt, so this is taking your net worth below zero. And on the right-hand side, we divide between financial and non-financial assets. By the way, I should say that, you know, this doesn't seem very detailed. Well, the reason is that different countries divide up their financial assets in different ways. And so to make consistent comparisons across countries, you have to have this fairly high level of aggregation. Um, so these are arranged from uh, South Africa, which has, uh, perhaps surprisingly, a very high percentage of assets in financial form. So it has very well-developed life insurance and pension industry. Also, property there is not very expensive. If you go online and find out, uh, you'll, you'll discover that you can have uh, a very nice house in either Sydney, Australia, or coastal city in South Africa, 
And you can find ones that look pretty similar, and the one in South Africa might be a quarter of the price of the one in uh, Australia. So that has something to do with that ratio. Uh, U.S. financial assets, very important. And then you go down, well, here, look at France. France is also, you know, very high-income country, but the ratio of financial to non-financial assets is quite different than it is in the U.S. or Japan. So there are these big differences, and... Uh, uh, we believe that uh, there's a lot of room for research on things like that. And anecdotally, uh, people uh, will tell stories about why there are these differences between countries, but uh, it would be better to have more uh, hard evidence. Here's a composition of financial assets. Uh, you know, that what we're doing is just looking at countries that have uh, um, household balance sheet uh, data here. Colombia is the one developed, one of the few developed countries that has that. And we've got a breakdown between currency and deposits. So, of course, you see the Japanese are famous for their uh, bank deposits, and they have over 50% of their financial assets in currency and deposits. And the Americans are famous for their uh, participation in the stock market. So you see they have this very long gray bar here, which is the uh, fraction of their financial assets, which are in equities. Japan has a tiny amount in equities. So somehow the finance gets through to the companies to some extent from the deposits, to some extent from these other financial assets, which include pensions. Um, but of course, another thing that's going on in Japan is that there's very high government debt. And so uh, quite a bit of these currency, this, these deposits are, you know, some of them are in the Japanese uh, post office, which is major uh, savings bank in, uh, in Japan. But this money, you know, a substantial part of it is not going to fund industry, it's going to fund the uh, government's debt. At any rate, a lot of variation there. Very interesting. Um, so in one of our reports, we looked at these uh, long-run trends, and of course, uh, particularly with publication of Thomas Piketty's important book, uh, there's been increasing focus on these things, you see. So here's France. Uh, this is the wealth-income ratio. So back around 1900, as Piketty has uh, uh, told us, it was high, 7 or 8, and then it slumped so badly in the 19th, the interwar period, and then again after the war, and since then has been increasing. Okay, that's very different from the pattern in the U.S., and so this is one of these things that, you know, really bears a lot more uh, research and thought. So here, the blue line is the U.S. Okay, so wealth-income ratio went up in the uh, Great Depression, but for most of these years, the ratio is between 4 and 5, and it's only very recently that it's once again gone up above that. And when our 2014 uh, numbers come up, we'll see that uh, this, uh, this ratio is uh, up again. Um, here's the, uh, so the OECD has been publishing uh, data uh, on a consistent basis for quite a long time now for the G7 countries. Uh, so we have this uh, interesting picture of what's been happening to the wealth-income ratio in those countries. And you can see broadly from the 1980s onward, there is this upward trend. Japan is different. Of course, it had this enormous boom in the 1980s, and then you know, things have been kind of you know, not doing very much since then. But the other countries uh, have had this upward trend. So this is one of the reasons we think that why people are so interested in wealth these days. It's becoming relatively more important. It's partly to, it's something to do with the aging of the population, but it's also because there's been this shift to the right in politics and there's much more emphasis on individual responsibility. And we're all supposed to save for our retirement and maybe for our future health care and for our children's education and so on. And uh, so, you know, in the developed world, um, there's more emphasis on the importance of wealth and I think the same thing is, same emphasis certainly is showing in the developing world uh, where due to the lack of social safety nets, you know, uh, personal assets are actually, I think, more important. Um, but the, you know, the long time series and the good data is only available for these high income countries. Here's what's been happening to debt. Actually, if you look at how much, the, this is the debt to income ratio, how much has it gone up? Well, go back to... Uh, the 1980s, the median was around about uh, 0.6 or 0.7, about 0.65, and the median for these countries is now about uh, 1.3, something like that, right? And that percentage-wise, that increase is in line with the increase in the uh, um, the assets. Um, so, you know, it's one of these things like you. Um, 
an important result, actually, of our work is uh, discovering that the uh, debt to assets ratio is much lower in countries where debt is more of a concern. Right? So people are concerned about debt loads in countries like India, but actually in aggregate terms, the debt to asset ratio is much lower than it is in advanced countries. You know, you kind of have to be well off before banks will lend you money. And in, you go to a country like Denmark, the uh, debts to uh, gross assets ratio is 20%. Uh, it's very high in a lot of uh, developed countries. It's not necessarily a problem, but of course, as we know, uh, can get out of hand if things are not uh, handled appropriately. Okay, so just uh, wrapping up, we've seen that... Uh, I'd like to emphasize that wealth data are getting stronger all the time, and, they're, and we believe they're sufficient to estimate the global distribution if, if uh, you're careful how you do it. Right? So sometimes people get discouraged about the quality of wealth data. I think that's, that's a really bad thing. Uh, it's, um, it's very unfortunate. People hear, well, there's some problems with wealth data, and then go away and think, well, we'll just forget about that. <laughs> the right response is to try to make it better. Unfortunately, a lot of people have been trying to do that, and the quality of the data is improving, and more countries have data and so on. Uh, so we have this high level of inequality. Uh, wealth and income are imperfectly correlated across countries, but the wealth differences are greater than the income differences. Uh, top tail adjustment is really vital. Uh, it makes a big difference to our picture of the upper tail of the wealth distribution, and, of course, also the lower tail. Uh, the more there is in the upper tail, the less there is in the lower tail, percentage-wise. Um, so I think that's about it. Thanks very much. <laughs>